of that design was it so that there would be a centerpiece area in the middle of the circle for an eventual um, monument to be erected. So um, they move forward with that. That design gets approved. They move forward with that design. Um, David Wills has to figure out, you know, is there going to be some kind of... Um, initially, I think the plan was just that there was not going to be any specific rhyme or reason where the soldiers necessarily got buried in that half-circle design, but, um, you know, certain governors of the different states, the, kind of the consensus was that, like, the men of the different states should be buried together with men of the state. So um, the cemetery did end up uh, being organized by states. Um, I think that of the top two states that lost the most men were Pennsylvania and New York. And I think in terms of uh, the thing you'll learn uh, if you're out there is that in terms of percentage-wise, I think New York, um, so I think Pennsylvania may have lost more men by number, um, but they also had more men than there in general. And by, but by percentage, uh, New York lost the highest percentage, had the highest percentage of deaths, let's say. Um, so Pennsylvania and New York, of course, a big part of that, that cemetery. And so the design moves forward and then it, and then they decide, um, you know, that, and even that is a process where, um, you know, they have to go and dig up all of the soldiers that had been already been partially buried or the ones that are still out there. So that is a process that David Wills has to organize. He contracts out uh, uh, a guy, um, and I forget the number. I mean, it's something ridiculous like, you know, I don't know, a couple, literally a couple cents per body. Uh, but he contracts out a guy, and then basically they, you know, he's contracted per body. So per body that is dug up and retrieved and brought to the cemetery, that guy would make, you know, a, a few pennies. Um, so then that individual puts together a team and, and they're the ones that are responsible for getting the bodies. But also keep in mind that uh, they have to do their best to figure out who these people are. It's not like you go into that cemetery and they're all on marked graves. Um, you know, most of them, most of them, or at least a lot of them do have, you know, the, the names of the soldiers. So um, it is the primary hope that you can not only figure out what state so that they're buried with their uh, the fellow the guys from their state, but that they know the individual's names and uh, so that's a process of you know when they dig it up is there anything on that soldier um is there any kind of identification on that soldier that says you know who he is um a lot of times the names were based on that when um sometimes you know if let's say the during the battle if their fellow soldiers were bearing their comrades you know, or they would create a marker, you know, they would, even if it was a piece of bark or something that they would scribble their name on something, uh, as a marker for their comrade. And, um, now if they couldn't get the name, then of course the next thing is they at least wanted to know its state. So, you know, when they dug up the bodies, they were trying to identify, um, by the uniform that they were wearing. So did the uniform give them an idea? Was it, you know, the, the belt buckle, um, you know, their, Maybe there's if they had a sword or anything like that, or just, or the buttons on their jackets, you know, that would let them know what state they were from. But in a lot of cases, you know, these uh, bodies, uh, they were unable to find out uh, their name or what state they fought for. So there is a section uh, of kind of like the unknown unknowns. Um, so that's what you'll see when you go to the cemetery. So that that is a big process behind it. Now, at some point, it is it uh, it's also David Wills' idea that. This cemetery should be dedicated, you know, that there should be a ceremony for the dedication of the um, cemetery. And now he kind of comes up with a plan um, that a, a structure that there would be, you know, like a, it would start with a parade uh, in, in town to the cemetery, you know, that there would be uh, like a, a marching band. Um, get to the cemetery, kind of um, begin with a, an opening prayer, uh, and then have a featured speaker. Okay. Now, when it came to just getting this featured speaker and deciding, um, I don't think anybody ever, you know, right off the bat thought, uh, let's have President Lincoln be the, the featured speaker. Um, they decided that they wanted to invite Edward Everett. Um, now, Edward Everett was just at that time just the premier orator of that time. 
Uh, he's somebody that people would g- want to turn out and listen to. Edward Everett, of course, on that day, November 19th, 1863, uh, when the cemetery was dedicated, would give over a two-hour speech, which seems just super long in today's standards to go out and just listen to someone go on and on for over two hours. But at the time, of course, that was equivalent to, you know, going and listening to a great uh, orator was the equivalent equivalent of going to the movies, uh, listening to a rock concert or something like that. Um, And then they decided to also invite President Lincoln. And in the invitation, they said, you know, would you come and, and, and quote, give a few uh, re- brief remarks, okay? Would you would you come and give a few brief remarks? So they're even kind of, from right off the bat, kind of saying like, you know, uh, <laughs> we're not asking you to come give a big speech or a few appropriate remarks. Would you come give a fr- few appropriate remarks? We're basically from the beginning saying, you know, can you come and say something brief? You know, you're not going to be the featured speaker, um, but, you know, and, and it's almost like an invitation, that, as I've been told, out of courtesy, you know, they didn't necessarily expect Lincoln to come, but they f- figured out of courtesy and respect that they, of course, should invite him. And then that's why they kind of uh, put it, you know, say to him, would you come give a few appropriate remarks so that if he does accept and come, that he doesn't give another, you know, a long-winded, long-winded speech. Um, and, you know, Lincoln was, was known uh, as a fantastic speaker. He really was, uh, even, you know, in his... Uh, running for president and things like that the first time, you know, he would speak for hours at events and people would love listening to him speak for a very long period of time. Um, Part of it, though, is Lincoln did have a knack for, he loved analogies. He would, um, he just loved analogies and he would always give analogies on things uh, in his, he just, you know, day-to-day conversations, but occasionally they would creep up in his speeches and they would often just be very weird analogies. And I think part of it, too, is they, they really kind of wanted to avoid. They were really fearful of Lincoln coming out and doing one of his speeches. And then on a day of dedicating, you know, a ceremony for fallen soldiers that, you know, in would pop one of his uh, kind of awkward analogies. So but of course, we do know Lincoln accepts the invitation, of course. Um, so and uh now the date is set when they invite um Everett to come and be the speaker i think they initially pitched him the date of october 23rd could you come you know we're planning to dedicate the ceremony october 23rd uh would would you come and do that and he he accepts the invitation but says uh that's not enough time for me i can't i can't do october 23rd and i'm going to need more time to prepare essentially so he says i can do november 19th and so that's why the date of november 19th is actually the date of the dedication because that's when uh Everett uh, was basically saying that he would come. And of course they, you know, everybody wanted him. Uh, it was pretty much an obvious that that at the time uh, and to all these people that that is the person that should be the featured speaker. So of course they accept the uh, change of date and, and move forward with November 19th. Now, um, so one of the things we, we get to the date of November 19th, um, you know, and, uh, of course, throughout history, at the time and through history, you know, on the one hand, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address goes down as the greatest, you know, one of the greatest speeches ever. Um, you know, we'll certainly talk about in a second what, it, you know, the reaction to it that day and shortly after. But apparently, you know, through history, there's this this idea that Lincoln kind of did the speech last minute or he wrote it on the train ride on the way to Gettysburg uh, or, the, you know, on a, on a back of a piece of, you know, envelope or something like that. Um, and, and this, you know, this isn't true. Lincoln, um, put a lot of time and thought in this. And, and it might've been a something where he put a lot of time and thought into it mentally. Like he was constantly thinking about what he would say and, f- and, and putting it together in his head before he, he sat down, uh, and wrote it on paper and, uh, wrote it out, but it's not necessarily the case. He certainly did not, you know, kind of wait to the last minute or just write it on the way there. Um, and I think he finished it, or he was editing it. He was he was editing the speech the night before. I believe he stayed at David Wills' house. So when he comes to Gettysburg on November 18th by train, he spends the evening at uh, David Wills' house. So, um, November 19th, uh, Everett gives his two-hour speech and sits down, and then Lincoln is introduced, and then Lincoln gives up and gives the Gettysburg Address. It lasts about... 
two minutes, 272 words, two minutes. Now, um, the facts of history are that Lincoln was interrupted five times by applause during a speech. And then there was a round of applause at the end. Um, Everett was not um, interrupted by applause once. Doesn't mean he didn't give a good speech. He had everybody, you know, kind of really caught up in the moment of his speech for two hours. Um, and he his speech was was kind of like a, 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 a narrative movie. You know, he went through the battle, the heroics of the three days and the details of the battle and to tell everybody what went on there. You know, and, it, and it, I'm sure it excited everybody. Um, and he, 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 I'm sure, gave great deep meaning to the events of the three days. But it was Lincoln who was interrupted five times by applause. During this very short speech, it, it would um, would love to know the points where the applause was and things like that. When you go through the speech and it's so short to imagine that he was interrupted five times by applause is actually quite crazy. And then, of course, pl- uh, applause at the end. Now... Um, of course, the the then the 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 reporters immediately begin writing about Lincoln's speech, and it's pretty much divided by divided right down the middle. If it was a newspaper um, that was for the war, um, or you know for the president, then hang on one sec. <coughs> oh. Excuse me. All right. A little dusty down here. Um, if it was a newspaper that was for the war and for the president, then of course it got a good review. Uh, if it was the opposite, then it got a bad review. If it was a newspaper that was, you know, for uh, against the war or for finally conceding to the Confederate Army and and declaring peace or accepting some kind of peace terms and ending the war, uh, or just a you know a Democratic paper against uh, against the president. Then it got bad reviews. And what's neat, when you go out to Gettysburg, if you go into the new visitor center uh, and do the museum, they have a whole room in the museum dedicated just to the Gettysburg Address, which, of course, is appropriate. And as you leave the room, the the last thing that you see are kind of uh, images on the wall of the newspaper articles from the time. And you see the juxtaposition of the... Uh, the headlines that praise his speech and those that um, mocked it uh, with one headline or one article calling it Lincoln's silly little speech. Um, so, so those are the, the facts of, of how, you know, it was reacted to, but there, you know, it was, wasn't uh, just hated like many people make it out to be. A lot of people did recognize that it was a fantastic speech. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm doing most of this off my head here, but I did want to bring a few things up. Um, I'm going to move the microphone here for a second so I can read a little bit better. But Everett himself said to the president afterwards, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. So he even gets kind remarks from uh, Everett there. So as a, as you can see, not everybody is... You know, anti his speech right off the bat. Just the uh, the newspapers of the day that don't like Lincoln in the war. Um, so at this point, um, we we'll go into we'll, we'll play out the the Gettysburg Address. But the reason that I kind of built up the story the way I did is I, I wanted to put us in a place in time. And one of the other things, I, and I this is going to be one part where. I might butcher the details. Um, even the whole time I've been doing this, this recording was debating on whether or not to bring this up. But I, I think it is, it's where it, it needs to be brought up. I think uh, it's just a, how well I get it correct. But I've been talking about the atmosphere of 1863. You know, we start off the year with the Emancipation Proclamation. We have uh, no one can imagine that the war should be would go on this long. Um, how upset Lincoln is that the that Meade didn't end the war right then and there. And how long would it continue to go? You have people that are just at this point um, clamoring to, to kind of give in and accept peace terms with the South. You have McClellan beginning his rise to run against Lincoln as a, the Democratic uh, nominee. This is this is the environment of the time. But um, Lincoln and his wife um, had lost uh, children t- uh, to you know sickness and, and disease and. And uh, I think two children before 1863, uh, at least one child. But the reason to bring that up is Lincoln's wife, um, her 
with losing a child, you know, her mental state was, um, just, I mean,